Hello. Hi. Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Monica Moreno Figueroa. <laughs> I'm senior lecturer in sociology here at the University of Cambridge and a fellow at Dublin College. And I will be your chair tonight. First, I want to welcome our guests and all of you on behalf of the University of Cambridge. This event is historic. Two of the most powerful black women speaking and writing today are addressing us here in Cambridge, which has never seen anything like it. Angela Davis and Jackie Kay are in the house. Yeah. So, Jackie and Angela's conversation today, in the largest venue we could find in town, <laughs> indeed, emerges from the growing movement to decolonize and decenter knowledge at the university. This movement is fueled by students' energies and demands and must remain vigilant and resist being somehow colonized again by the well-meaning whiteness of institutional forces. It is in everybody's interest to consider this movement's proposal, which is, in my view, to think about how we can be more critical and comprehensive, more inclusive and flexible, more committed and responsible in the teaching, learning, research, and community work we do here in Cambridge. This decolonizing movement connects us with a global conversation crossing many western Center universities it connects us with wider discussions about social injustice and the pressing challenges of the climate crisis we are living and dying through. Crucially, thinking about decolonization allows us to both imagine and demand that this is not the only time that an event like this happens here, that this has not become an exception. People of color will not and cannot be the exception anymore, anywhere. Yeah. While I'm here as another black woman on this stage, and I can see many people of color in the audience, I am one of only five academics self-identified as black of all academic staff at the University of Cambridge. This is just one indicator of the terrain we are in, telling us what is next, signaling to us a path we may forge. I am sure I do not need to read out the amazing biographies of our guests. Instead, I would like to say some brief words about them. Jackie and Angela care about the world. They care about justice and they care about what living in freedom means. We can see their understanding of the difficulties we face as people and their exasperation in the face of oppression and injustice. Angela and Jackie have the amazing ability to move us, to touch us emotionally, to inspire us to act. They have found the most direct and persuasive ways to communicate what is important and they get heard. They guide us to move between everyday experiences and broader visions for a fair and kind world. They are powerful with their words, showing us different strategies to question, confront, intervene, and change within and beyond institutions, always alive to the connections between movements, working towards a politics of solidarity. Jackie Kay is a poet laureate of Scotland. She teaches us with the most exquisite words to listen to language and that poetry is both political and accessible. In the words of her fellow writer and Cambridge resident, Ali Smith, Jackie Kay is a finder of multidisciplinary possibilities, the music in the voice, the voice for those who have none, 
The real something in the seeming nothing, the poem in the drama, the story in the poem, the true in the fictive. Jackie teaches us to fully appreciate what kindness is and to enact it in our lives, probably the most revolutionary of acts. Angela Davis' name is synonymous for, with struggles for liberation. Angela has talked about how our lives today are the result of the energies and imaginations of those who came before us. In turn, we may not witness the consequences of the work we do, the realization of the worlds we imagine, but we must do this work. It is clear to me, just in seeing the vibe and strength of this gathering, that Angela and Jackie are, and us with them here today, creating and sustaining the terrain for transformation and liberation for years to come. The importance of this conversation is evident in the fact that so many departments and centers of the university have come together to make it possible. Special thanks go to the amazing organizing by Dr. Catherine Median and Professor Sarah Franklin, the decolonizing working group of the Department of Sociology and the Vice Chancellor's Office. So without further ado, and open to imagining the worlds that both of these amazing women compel us to engage with, let's have a round of applause for Jackie Kay and Angela Davis. Thank you so much, Monica, for that wonderful introduction. Thank you, everybody here, for having us. Thank you to the University of Cambridge for, for hosting this. And thank you so much, Angela, for agreeing to come and have a conversation with me. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Jackie. Thank you. I'm so excited about our conversation. Usually, I know what to expect, but I have no idea what to expect this <laughs> evening, and that's very exciting. On my bedroom wall is a big poster of Angela Davis, who's in prison right now for nothing at all, except she wouldn't put up with stuff. <laughs> my mum says she's only 26, which seems really old to me. <laughs> but my mum says it's young. <laughs> Just imagine, she says, being on America's 10 most wanted people's list at 26. <laughs> I can't. Angela Davis is the only female person I've seen, except for a nurse on TV who looks like me. She has big hair like mine that grows out instead of down. <laughs> My mum says it's called an afro. <laughs> if I could be as brave as her when I get older, I'll be okay. Last night, I kissed her goodnight again and wondered if she could feel the kisses in prison mm -hmm. all the way from Scotland. Her skin is the same too, you know. I can see my skin is that color, but most of the time I forget. So sometimes when I look in the mirror, I give myself a bit of a shock and say to myself, do you really look like this? Mm -hmm. As if I'm somebody else. I wonder if she does that. I don't believe she killed anybody. It's all a load of phony lies. My dad says it's a setup. I asked him if she'll get the electric chair like them Roseberries he was telling me about. No, he says, the world is on her side. Well, how come she's in there then, I think. I worry she's going to get the chair. I worry she's worrying about the chair. My dad says she'll be putting on a brave face. He brought me a badge home, which I wore to school. It said, free Angela Davis. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> and 
and all my pals says, who's she? <laughs> <laughs> Um, growing, growing up uh, as I did in, in Glasgow and with parents that were in the Communist Party, I did have that B. Angela Davis poster on my wall and I did think about you and it is an extraordinary circle, one of life's strange circles mm -hmm. to find myself uh, sat here now. Um, we met last, last year in, in, in Dublin but it feels um, as if I've known you for a lifetime and it must feel like that for many people here in this hall because your name, your, the very utterance of your name, to utter your name is to also think about comradeship, solidarity, courage, hope, companionship. Your name is such a beacon of hope um, for all of us and it still has that poetic ring to it. Mm. Angela Davis, mm -hmm. and uh, don't you think so, Angela <laughs> Davis? <laughs> well, thank you, and thank you, Jackie. Um, you know, when we met um, almost exactly one year ago, um, I felt this sense of kinship, uh, and um, I, I remember we, we talked about our um, parents, our families, and it was this wonderful exchange. Um, and then, and then later, in preparation for this event uh, and the symposium sponsored by Decolonizing Sociology and Office of the Vice Chancellor, I, um, I started to think about the, the work that was um, produced by uh, black British feminists, uh, um, uh, women of African and Asian descent uh, in, in this country. And, and I remembered this anthology that I hadn't seen referred to. Uh, and the title of the anthology is Charting the Journey. Do you remember that? Do any of you, are any of you old enough to remember? <laughs> I see people here, I know Gail. You. And then I said, oh yes, this is an anthology that was um, edited, co-edited by Gail Lewis, um, by Pratiba Palmer, and I know both of them. And then I looked at it and I said, oh my God, Jackie Kay was one of the co-editors and I taught this anthology. So I do have this relationship uh, that goes back to um, the early 90s. It's, it's fantastic. And I did, I did um, experience your kiss. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I know I did, I know. Well, that, that was my next question. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I was actually wondering, you know, when you were in prison and you had this sense that there were people, that your name was being spoken in strangers' households all around the world, and that, that you were a household name, but a name held by the houses, held by the people within the houses, um, so as your, your name is precious um, to them, um, as you are precious to them. I wonder if if that ever set up any kind of disjunct between yourself and your name, or if, you, if, or, or, or if it set up a, a strangeness between a public and a private self, or if it always felt as one? Um, well, much of what was happening um, in the world in terms of organizing around my case, um, I really didn't discover until after. Uh, my trial was over. Although um, my attorneys and my comrades and friends did sometimes bring photographs in and they would tell me about you know, demonstrations that, that happened uh, um, in this country and in and, and, and that country. Um, but I don't know whether I um, had a sense of the enormity of it. Uh, and it was really remarkable. But when I did think about it, I, I asked myself, well, do I, as, a, as an individual, really deserve all of this attention? Uh, you know, I'm only one person. And that was an era of intense 
a repression. Um, there were many other people in prison. I looked at the women who were in the jails where I was, and, and I asked, well, well, who's supporting, who's supporting them? Uh, and so uh, eventually the campaign that was originally called um, National United Committee to Free Angela Davis, the name was changed to <laughs> National United Committee to Free Angela Davis and All Political Prisoners. Uh, uh, because it didn't make sense to me, uh, as, as, um, as afraid as I might have been, um, uh, it didn't make sense for there to be so much um, activism and activity throughout the world focused on one single individual. Uh, and, and I still feel that way. And I, and, and I know that um, this is, I guess, how I address what you call the public, what did you call it? The public, public private. And the private. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I don't know whether I would call it the public and the private. I think I would, I think I would um, uh, refer to uh, the fact that my image was primarily um, a kind of, um, I don't know, uh, a reminder, a prompt. Uh, uh, and I was not the, I was not the, 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 the central character there. The central character was this collective movement and the fact that millions of people all over the world came together. And I still think of myself as someone who needs to attest to uh, the fact that, that that movement was successful. If it was successful in releasing me, then it can be successful in achieving uh, so many of the other goals against you know, racism, misogyny, homophobia, et cetera, in the world that we need today. Uh, yeah. So I don't take myself that seriously. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's why we all love you. <laughs> <laughs> but but it's, it's it's really interesting and probably fascinating for for, for all of us who who um, for for whom you're very important and for the, the struggle that relationship between the individual and the movement because I think it must be the that way of being able to understand what happened to you as being part of a movement that actually was in a sense also a survival technique um, because if you hadn't been able to do that and see that in that way it could have been potentially quite quite damaging um, to have that kind of level of weight <coughs> of weight and responsibility mm. in a sense put onto one name your own name you know in a sense that name belonging to everybody else whilst mm. also belonging to yourself could have been very very difficult had you not also found this way of thinking about it to mm. as being part as yourself as being part of a movement do you, do you think that helped in some way well you know it didn't happen immediately mm -hmm. i didn't uh, immediately understand that uh, um, relationship uh, and i suppose there were many moments when i thought um, how can i possibly live up to everyone's expectations uh, you know i'm one person uh, and i try to do uh, the work that needs to be done to help to build struggles and uh, you know all of the uh, 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 communities, re revolutionary and radical communities that that we want to build. But I'm just I'm just a single individual. So how can I possibly live up to everyone's expectations? Uh, um, and you know it's so funny. I remember when I got out of jail. Um, <laughs> I love that sentence, all in one sentence. It's, it's so funny, I remember when I got no, this out of like, jail. This is, this is like really funny because I did not know how to deal with this. So, you know, I had been in jail for about two years and, and so of course I was, I was in my late 20s and I was still, you know, wanting to party and so I would go to these parties and people would see me and feel obligated to have a political <laughs> conversation when the music was blasting and I could hardly hear what they were saying. 
Um, and so for a while, I, I refused to do that. I said, I'm not going to go to a party and, 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 and have to, um, uh, in, in, in effect, play this role. Um, so I learned later how to um, demystify. You know, you don't have to do that. <laughs> Let's dance. <laughs> Let's have some fun this evening. <laughs> but for a while, it was it was pretty pretty overwhelming. But you know, uh, I often tell this a story about a young woman that I um, that I met uh, a number of years ago who was wearing a a T-shirt with my picture on it. Uh, because to be frank. When I would see people with um, my image on their t-shirts, it was embarrassing, <laughs> you know? Uh, uh, and uh, so I said to her, she was a, a, young, a young woman who was thinking about going to college, foster child. She was in the foster system in the US, young black woman. So I said, why do you have that t-shirt on? And, and, you know, what is it, what's the big deal? Uh, and so she said, you know, whenever I wear this T-shirt, it makes me feel powerful. Mm. It makes me feel as if I can do whatever I want to do. And it was at that moment that I, I think I, I was able to um, understand that, you know, dialectic uh, and recognize that it wasn't at all about me. You know, that my image served as a way of thinking about um, processes of empowerment. Mm -hmm. It served as a, a way to think about the possibility that people, when they came together, could achieve insurmountable goals. Absolutely, and th that, that thing of you, you saying, it's not about me, if you were to say that to the young girl she would she would say actually no it is um and that that's that's the strange thing because i understand completely what you're mm -hmm. saying and i think mm -hmm. that it, I, I i think that you saying it's not about me is true completely on the one hand but on the other hand i think no yeah, <laughs> no yeah. no it's it's not true because it is about you and it's one of those <laughs> 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 and, it, and it's one of those kind of really charming, charming um, conundrums, yes. and, and it actually comes out of you. The actual having that uh, that paradox, if you like, mm. is also part of Angela Davis herself, because because you have a, a kind of a, a you're a mixture of of being uh, of so many multiple selves in a way. You know, the, there's Angela Davis, the scholar. Angela Davis, the activist. Angela Davis, the, 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 the person who was on the 10 most wanted list. Is Angela Davis, the magnificent woman sat here now with her lovely scarf and her sense of humor. <laughs> there's, the, there's Angela Davis who loves music and, mm. and foods and, and having a good time. And there's all of these different selves and yet people will often meet with the expectation that they're just going to meet this part. And mm -hmm. society often tries to put us into one box or to ask us to choose, you know. I remember in the 80s, we were, were always being asked, you know, in the late 70s, 80s, what's more important to you, being black or being a woman or mm -hmm. being a lesbian? And, you, you know, it was, it did your head in and all of that? Right. You know, I, I remember once doing an interview with a journalist and saying that I was fed up being a Scottish journalist, being described as a black lesbian <laughs> feminist, you know, black Scottish lesbian feminist. And then suddenly in the newspaper, there was a headline. <laughs> <laughs> and, and my grand saw this headline, it was in a Sunday paper, and she hadn't seemed to have gotten on to the fact that I was a lesbian, even though I'd, <laughs> even though I'd taken successive girlfriends around to her house <laughs> for her gingerbread. <laughs> and, I, and she phoned my mum and said, does our fairy ken about this? Which means, you know, does our, does our father know about this? Oh, okay. And, and, uh, and, uh, and then she said, ah, well, there's one thing, no money people read that big paper. <laughs> <laughs> Not it, many people read that, that big, big paper. paper. Okay. Yeah. 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 I'm translating. <laughs> you're, you're catching on fast. <laughs> but but that, that business of, of people asking you to choose between different yes, aspects yes, of yes, yourself yes, yes. and yourself being a, a multiple self, people will often, I suppose, ask you as well whether or not the experience that you had when you were 26 feels as if it was belonged to a different person or whether it's 
whether you feel as if you're all the same person, if you see what I mean. And to me, you know, when I look at you now, it's as if your younger self anticipated the woman that you, mm. that is sat here before us in the Corn Exchange mm. in Cambridge. Well, when I was that age, I know I would never have been able to imagine being 75 years old. <laughs> that was like beyond uh, the scope of my imagination. Um, but, um, but in a sense, um, I think you're probably right. Uh, and I'm, but you know what I'm thinking about? I'm thinking about the fact that um, um, a lot of people from that era did not survive. Uh, so I'm actually um, among a few of us uh, who survived and who can um, bear witness. Um, so I kind of, I think of myself as um, a witness uh, to, you know, that historical moment and, and all of the, uh, the, 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 the wonders, the revolutionary wonders, but all of the contradictions and all of the problems. Uh, uh, and, and so, yeah, I'm actually kind of amazed uh, I, when, when I think about, when I think about those uh, times when many of us did not expect to survive, mm -hmm. precisely because of the uh, repression. Uh, and I think about the work that so many people did. I was just one of many people, and I, 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 I constantly have to uh, uh, point out that uh, it's not fair to, to ask me to bear the burden as an individual of all of that history. Yeah. I mean, people, um, to even today, for some reason, I became associated with with Afros, and I, I just, uh, I really don't understand. <laughs> I really don't understand because, because when I decided to wear my hair natural, it was because other black women were wearing their hair natural. I was copying others. And somehow, um, when people talk about Afros now, they use my name. Yeah, and you're, that's you're the go-to Afro. <laughs> it's the go-to. I guess it's because it's the, you're, you're the person whose Afro became very, very iconic, and who's really recognised because of the struggle and because of everything that happened. Because of, I guess your, your your life became like a story that was happening to you, and um, which which you know sometimes I think when our lives do become stories that are happening to us, which often happens when something traumatic has happened to us, mm. or or when we've been recently bereaved, or when something really shocking has happened mm. to us, we, we tend to slightly step outside of ourselves and look at our life as if it's telling a story back to us. Mm. And, um, and sometimes that, that, that very um, action means that we have to write, that we kind of get prompted in order to, mm. we get prompted to pick up the pen rather than the, than the arms or the spade, because we suddenly think, I've, I've got to write to make sense of all of this. And I'm wondering when you wrote your autobiography, which was published t two years after um, 72, published in 74, whether or not you felt that compelled to write it to, not just to remember everything that happened, but to also f find a space to try and understand and process some of what was happening. No. No, no. I really did not. Mm -hmm. um, I thought that I was too young to write mm. an autobiography. Mm. I didn't think that um, that my story was so exceptional mm. that that it deserved to be preserved in uh, that genre. Mm. But of course, I was thinking of the genre in the. Uh, bourgeois masculinist way in which it had evolved, like, you know, the exceptional, uh, the exceptional individual who uh, provides lessons uh, to the readers. And I had many arguments with Toni Morrison. <laughs> As you do. <laughs> <laughs> because, 
you know, Toni Morrison was not yet Toni Morrison. <laughs> she was an editor at a Random House Publishing Company. And she tried to convince me to write an autobiography. And my first answer was no. Uh, you know, what, 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 if, what do I have to say? And then, you know, I'm not uh, the kind of person who readily reveals all of the aspects of my private life. Uh, so I, says, I said, um, you know, they wanna, they're gonna want to know the first time I had sex and this and that. And I said, That's, I don't wanna do that. Uh, and what was interesting was that um, uh, Tony, who's still a very good friend, uh, um, told me that I could write the kind of autobiography I wanted to write. And I said I wanted to write a political autobiography. And uh, not only was I able to do that kind of writing, which uh, I, uh, I, I appreciated the fact that she was willing to stand up for me because the people at Random House were basically interested in selling books. Uh, so they didn't, they really didn't, um, they wanted the conventional autobiography. Uh, and she supported me, she defended me. Uh, uh, and, and now that autobiography is going to be made into a film. Does that, yeah. does that feel strange? That feels scary. Strange. Uh -huh. It feels really in, scary. In what way is it scary? Well, for one, you know, I'm a very shy person. <laughs> you may not believe it, but I, I am. I really am. I've always been shy. And I still forget when I go out that people may recognize me on the street. <laughs> Um, it's, it's always a surprise to me. And so I think about the fact that if this film is made, uh, uh, I'll just have to uh, retreat for a while. Uh, I mean, it's wonderful to have people recognize you, uh, but sometimes it's a bit much. <laughs> you know, like going shopping. And uh, I, I remember once I was in Whole Foods in, 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 Burke, in Oakland. And this woman said, Angela Davis. And I, and I said, yeah. Um, I mean, I had my shopping cart, right? Uh, and she says, may I take a picture with you? And I said, OK, I guess so. So she took a picture. And then she started yelling to people all over the store. <laughs> you know, Look who's here. And this, and so. Uh, from then on, I had my partner do all the shopping. I refused to go into Whole Foods. Uh, That's a handy excuse. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I'm going I'm to try that myself. I don't like myself. shopping anyway, but... <laughs> I'm going to try that myself. That's great. Um, <laughs> but, you know, the, the film, um, it's... it's um, I'm actually interested in it now. Mm -hmm. Uh, for a while, I wasn't. I mean, it happened because um, my niece, uh, my sister's daughter, who was named after me, her name is Angela Issa Davis, uh, she, um, she's a playwright um, and an actor. When she was in her 20s, uh, she said, I'm going to turn the autobiography into a film script. And I said, OK, she was like 22. I said, sure. <laughs> And she said, but you have to sell me the rights. So I sold the rights to her for a dollar. <laughs> and then 20 years later, or 25 years later, she does develop a script. And so that's, that's how the film actually uh, came about. But what I find exciting about it is the fact that um, uh, Julie Dash, and I don't know if you're familiar with the work of uh, Julie Dash, Daughters of, uh, Daughters, of Dash. Uh, Daughters of the Dust. Julie Dash is going to direct it. Uh, so to me, it's, it's exciting, not because it focuses on me, but because I get to be a part of something that uh, uh, Julie Dash uh, does. Uh, yeah, and in that way also, the, the idea of, of truth being stranger than fiction, it, it, it goes around in a full circle, in a sense, because there'll be somebody 
playing you, um, somebody is playing the part of you that you'll then be able to watch seeing how they play you, which is a kind of weird, you know, weird thing and, and, and a weird thing to consider. But my um, book, Red Dust Rose... But I don't know, if, if someone... Your, your um, memoir is going to be transformed into a play, right? Mm. So somebody's going to be playing you. I know. As well. <laughs> <laughs> I, know, I know that's what I mean, it's strange. My mum keeps saying about that, who's going to be playing me? <laughs> she's, and by she's, the way, if you, haven't, if you haven't read uh, uh, Jackie's uh, memoir, uh, Red, Dust, um, Road. Road, Red Dust Road, you should read it. It's uh, really moving and, and fascinating and an amazing story. Oh, thank you. But it is a strange... <laughs> I'm getting shy now. I'm getting shy now. But um, let's jump to Trump. <laughs> Ooh. No, no, I'm only joking. No, I was thinking about... I, I, I was thinking about in, our, in the times that we... But we try not to pronounce his name. We no, call him true. the current occupant okay, of 1600 current. Pennsylvania Avenue. Okay, that's good, that's good. <laughs> the, current, the current occupant of 1600. Because I was thinking that these times that we live in when we, we think about truth and reality and fake news and how difficult and how hard it is to cling on to our realities and um, how often they get challenged, our actual understanding of reality or, or our experience of it, how often it gets challenged by different people um, and that, you know, Racism, you could say, is one of the aspects of racism that's so distressing, actually, is because it challenges um, what your perceptions of reality are, because people don't necessarily assume or accept that what you've experienced is racism, and then that, that can itself create all sorts of difficult, extraordinary problems. I was wondering what it is like at the moment living in the States with the current occupant of 1600 <laughs> Pennsylvania Avenue? Well, you know, it is, um, it's horrendous. Um, I don't think any of us could have imagined that we would find ourselves in, 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 in such a state. Um, but then on the other hand, it's exciting because um, the, his election uh, has produced such resistance and um, this resurgence of, of activism among people one might have never expected uh, would want to uh, get involved. Uh, I don't think it's um, accidental that uh, the campaign against um, misogynist violence uh, over the last couple of years mm -hmm. has, has really surged. Uh, um, the, uh, you know, I, I, I think that uh, the solidarity uh, movement around Palestine uh, has, has, has really grown and developed over the last uh, couple of years. Um, the, uh, fact that Students for Justice for Palestine, which is a student organization on college mm -hmm. and university campuses, uh, uh, that that has um, uh, increased uh, mm -hmm. you know, quite, quite, in quite an amazing way. Yeah, so you had that extraordinary experience recently, didn't you, last in February of this year, where you were offered a prize, and then the prize was rescinded, the Fred L. Shuttleworth Prize. Yeah, it was weird, you know, the, 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 and I'm, I grew up in Birmingham, Alabama, so uh, I still have a lot of ties in, in Birmingham. I knew Fred Shuttlesworth. I went to school with his children. And, and so when the Civil Rights Institute uh, offered me this human rights uh, um, award named after Fred Shuttlesworth, I said, I told them how excited I was. Uh, um, but then, then shortly before I was supposed to go to Birmingham to receive it, they called me and they told me that uh, due to my public statements that they were rescinding the award. And I said, well, what public statements? Well, it's a part of pu the public record. 
And I said, well, what are you talking about? They never even told me that it was about my support uh, for uh, justice for Palestine. And, um, but you know, it's actually quite amazing. Uh, at first, I said, what? Oh, you know, all, all I agreed to do was to accept a human rights award. And now, it, you know, there's all of this controversy swirling. Uh, uh, that always seems to happen to me, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and one of my old comrades oh, wrote me and, and said something about, you know, you really don't have to do anything. All you have to do is be there. <laughs> and I said, yeah, and I wish I were would, I would doing the organizing around someone else. I wish I weren't at the center. But um, what was so amazing was that the black community in Birmingham, along with... Um, um, quite a number of uh, Jewish organizations and individuals immediately stood up and challenged the board of directors of the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute. Uh, and they stood up for Palestine because, I mean, what, what, what the board was saying was that, um, I'm sorry, but our human rights perspective doesn't include certain people. It doesn't include Palestinians. And, and so our response was that, um, in the words of, of Dr. Martin Luther King, justice is indivisible. You don't get to decide who deserves justice and who doesn't. Palestinians deserve justice as much as black people in the South deserve justice. Uh, and so, so as it turns out, it was the occasion for a, 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 a major surge in, 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 in work around justice for Palestine. And strangely, I mean, it's one of those strange conundrums, isn't it? And again, another strange paradox, because had that not happened, had they not gone to offer you the prize, and then rescinded it, the, this, the, the amount of, of support and the amount of, of, of response wouldn't have happened in the same way either. Um, so life is full of these kind of strange... I know, it is. It really is. And you know, there was, a group, there was a group called... Uh, and I, I received thousands and thousands of statements of support. And there was a group of rabbis, mm -hmm. uh, a, a large group of rabbis called Reconstructionist Rabbis, <laughs> I'd like to meet one and of them. And they wrote this yeah. really powerful yeah. statement. What, what I found so um, moving was the fact that so many Jewish organizations mm -hmm. from all over the world sent in uh, their support. Mm -hmm. And one, never, one would not have known had that not happened. Yeah. So, so you're right, it's, it's kind of strange yeah. and, and unexpected gifts. Yeah, yeah unexpected exactly. gifts. And I think, you know, when, it, when I think about your, your life in, in some ways, there, there have been, even with very, very difficult things, you've, you've found a way of taking those very difficult things and turning them, if you like, into unexpected gifts. And that's part of, I think that's part of your strength, you as, as, as Angela Davis, that is your real personal strength. Um, not everybody, I don't think, is able to, to, to deal with hardship in exactly that way. But I think if we can find a way to, to, um, to, to be like you know, Audre Lorde's poem, a, a litany of, of survival, it's mm -hmm. better to, to speak remembering we were never meant to survive. And when we're, when we're silent, we're still afraid. So it's better to speak remembering that, 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 um, that we were never meant to survive. I think that, that um, Audre Lorde was another one of those people that, you, that, that I think of as being a, a, a courageous soul in the world that spoke out um, and also managed to turn difficult things into, into gifts in some way. I'm just wondering what, what other times you feel that's happened to you in your, in your life where there's been some sort of unexpected gift, would you describe, even though it was very difficult, your time in prison as, as, as being that in some way because of all of the things that that, that inside time taught you inside yourself? Well, first of all, thank you so much for evoking the name of Audre Lorde. Uh, we've learned so much from Audre Lorde. Uh, uh, and um, um, I think I've learned from her that um, contradictions can be generative. Um, 
and I'd been a Marxist for a very long time and we worked with contradictions and dialectics and Aufhebung and all of that. So, but it wasn't really until I, I read Audre Lorde that, that it clicked, it made sense. Uh, um, and the fact that we, can, that we can be afraid and still act, that, that, that fear is not the, 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 the polar opposite of action, or if it is, we figure out how to work inside that contradiction. Uh, because you know, many people have asked me, uh, well, how is it that you avoided being afraid? You know, as if courage requires you to uh, somehow uh, um, guarantee that fear doesn't enter into your uh, emotional um, response. Uh, and, and so, yeah, we could talk about Audrey. And, you know, I'd yeah, I, so I, 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 I remember when I met Audrey, she said to me, you know, Jackie, you can be black and Scottish. Right, <laughs> exactly, exactly. She said, she said exactly. you don't have to choose. Exactly. And, at, and at age 23, that was quite a revolutionary <laughs> idea to me because uh, I thought that I was going to, you know, that you, that you did have to choose then. Um, but, yeah, but, but you know, you're right um, about the experience. You know, I was only in jail for um, 18 months. Yeah, months. yeah, 18 months. That's, that's just a drop in a bucket. That's not very long at all. Although it did seem like it was a long time. <laughs> I mean, I can remember I, when I was first arrested, I said, oh my God, I've been in jail for a week. Uh, and then like a month. I can't believe I've been in jail for a month. Uh, um, but I realized that I learned so much uh, from that experience uh, that, uh, that it really helped to shape my trajectory uh, from then until now. And I would, if someone told me that I could return and relive my life without that experience, I would probably say, no, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. I don't think so, uh, um, because uh, I, I learned how important it is to focus on those who have been cast aside and marginalized. Uh, uh, I've been really fortunate to work with you know, wonderful um, activists over the years uh, developing um, the, the whole notion of the prison industrial complex. Uh, and um, you know, arguing for uh, you know, arguing uh, for prison abolition, uh, uh, w which I wish we could you know talk about this evening. Uh, you know, maybe we will have a little time. Um, abolition feminism. Uh, you know, we we talk about the fact that feminism is not a unitary phenomenon, uh, uh, and I think that um, abolition. Uh, feminism helps us to uh, formulate um, a revolutionary feminism, a feminism that embraces uh, 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 women of color, working class women, uh, uh, and that, not that just seems women, very different now, trans. Doesn't it? it seems very, very different now, our understanding of what feminism can be compared to um, the 70s, the late 70s and the early 80s. It oh, seems yeah. very, very different um, when there was all sorts of different, uh, when white feminists would assume that that, yeah. that that was feminism and that there wasn't any sort of other voices. But we, we heard, also that assume that was feminism. Yes, yeah, yes, so, probably. Yeah, and so, know, that, so that's really massively, massively changed. What, what do you think has made that, that change happen in that way? Do you think that people are making, that all of us are making more, dif more connections between one movement and another, that, that, that these kind of boxes have, have changed completely and that people are jumping in and out of different different spaces um, and, and m making multiple connections between one group and another or do you think that like a movement say like Black Lives Matter is very different to, to any movement that we had in the 70s or the 80s? Well, this is the beginning of a very long conversation, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, I, I do think that uh, uh, 
that if, that if we work to produce certain ways of understanding of the world, uh, and even if we don't really have the conceptual um, tools that we need, uh, uh, you know, no one had ever come up with the, had never spoken about the term intersectionality. Uh, and, you know, maybe we could have a conversation about the fact that, that the use of intersectionality in this mechanical way today uh, absolves us of the responsibility of doing, you know, further theoretical and practical work. Uh, because certainly that term came out of a long history of attempting to develop theories and, and practices uh, that, that put things together that weren't, uh, uh, that were ideologically torn asunder, that we weren't really allowed to think together. And there were those of us, and you know, because you're one of, uh, you, you're younger than I am, but uh, you know, you're, I think you're the next generation. Uh, uh -huh. uh, to, to, to be able to, to, think, um, to think contradictions in a productive way. We were talking about Audre Lorde just a, a while ago. And I think that if we manage to convey uh, those struggles in such a way that another generation comes and, 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 and takes it up and moves it further. I you know, always like the metaphor uh, that we're standing on the shoulders of the generation uh, before us, and then there will be those who stand on our shoulders. Uh, and, and those who are on our shoulders have, have um, a much um, longer vision they're able to see so much further. So it's, it makes sense that um, the, 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 the younger um, activists, feminists, uh, uh, and I'm not afraid to use that term now. I, I used it, in a, uh, I was very reluctant. The first time someone called me a feminist, I said, no, 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 I am not a feminist. Uh, I, even though I had just written a book called Women, Race, and Class. <laughs> Uh, because I, I, for, for, for me, feminism was a kind of, today we call it glass ceiling feminism. It was about, you know, those who were attempting to um, assimilate into an existing apparatus. Uh, those who wanted to join men in the work of keeping the apparatus of uh, uh, repression going. And so... There were those of us who had to say, no, we, it, it's about transforming the structures. It's about uh, creating a, a, um, a new society. It's about imagining new possibilities. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and because there's so much of that happening now, I mean, in, in a strange sense, even though we have the, the current occupant <laughs> and we have the Brexit crisis and we have sort yeah, of comedians, have comedians taking over <laughs> yeah. Ukraine and... We have, um, you know, we have all sorts of realities that, that seem that Bolsonaro, yes, that, that, yeah. Netanyahu, yeah. Duterte. I mean, yes, exactly. And we, and yes, at the same time, we have this. We have all of you here, and we have so many young faces that we're looking straight out into the audience and seeing. And that gives me hope because actually, I think probably the future is not going to be the Democrats or the Republics or Labour or Conservative or whatever. The, the future is going to be this, um, this third way. And I think if we can, you know, you, you, you talk about a third way of trying to find a third, a third way. Um, and when you look out here t today, do you, do you think there, there it is in some ways? Here you are. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you're absolutely right. I think that, you know, we have to generate that hope. Um, and hope is, as Walter Benjamin said, we're given hope for the sake of those who are without hope. And, um, and young people cannot live without hope. Uh, and that is why um, the 
the real revolutionaries are, are always really the youth, young people. And those of us who are older have to recognize that. And, um, you know, and I don't, I don't mind uh, being the person now who needs to learn how to um, uh, follow the leadership of younger people. I, I like that. Um, don't you? Yeah, I do. I think it's great. Also, it makes me feel young. Um, <laughs> I could just hang out, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and, well, you know, age is relative in yeah, any way, yeah, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> <laughs> but I, I like the, the idea that you were, you were talking about earlier, that, that we're on a kind of a, a path, um, you know, that our lives are journeys, um, hopefully not necessarily circular journeys, and that, you know, you, you grew up with your with your mum and dad that were politically involved in, in, in their way that was different from your way of, of being politically involved. And I don't know how they, um, they, their way of actually dealing with your political involvement must have been an interesting thing at the time. Um, but, but then your, the, the people that come after you will behave in, in a different way again. And I think that we, 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 um, we kind of both anticipate the ghosts of ourselves and the ghosts of ourselves are behind us and we it's a bit like again to, to quote Audrey you know we don't really it's not so much that we leave our dead behind us it's that our dead are also up in front of us mm -hmm. too because a lot of the people that have become pioneers actually are leading the way in different ways too so who would have expected um, Audrey for instance to be experiencing this kind of renaissance mm -hmm. at the moment mm -hmm. it's not so much that she's behind us but that she's ahead so I think mm -hmm. that, that time's quite a, a, a fascinating thing in that way and that we keep we keep getting to move seats as it well or move our footsteps on the mm -hmm. on the road and that and that time time keeps I suppose a different clock don't you think like the, the clock that's kept in prison is a different clock from the clock ticking now and the clock that's set for grief is grief keeps a different clock mm -hmm. altogether because grief time is a different time for everybody so I'm, I'm, I suppose I'm just really interested in in that vantage point for, for, for you now Angela that you're the age that you are how you see the time over the course of your your life and into the, the future how you see it I mean, it's, it's a bit of a nebulous question but you can you can run with it whichever way you want. <laughs> well, I suppose I suppose I do um, experience a different temporality uh, now, um, and and I don't know whether it's simply as a result of having grown older, um, because I think that. Uh, we can all, regardless of our age, benefit from expanded temporalities. Uh, uh, we can benefit from a time that is not capitalist time. Uh, and this is this the first time we've evoked capitalism? <laughs> is it? No, you mentioned well, you mentioned capitalism. Yeah, because cap yeah. because that's what we've been talking about the whole time. Uh, we've been talking about it, <clears throat> but um, too often we we so take um, the products of capitalism, whether they're capitalist temporalities or whether they're capitalist commodities, we so take them for granted that we have difficulty imagining a different way and and so I think that um, that it helps to uh, um, emancipate oneself from this uh, notion that uh, the only possible temporality is measured by the life of an individual uh, that 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 our time is the 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 time that's marked between our birth and death dates. Um, because after all, if we're trying to change the world, it's not gonna happen. Um, it's not gonna happen um, suddenly. Um, the clock is not simply going to stop and then we enter into a different dimension. Uh, 
and you know, people uh, often um, ask me about how we felt about the revolution in the 60s. And I said, yeah, of course we thought the revolution was around the corner. You know, because you know, the Cuban revolution had happened and in, 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 in Africa there were all kinds of liberation movements and we were convinced that there was gonna be a revolution. And now I say, I'm really glad that, that, that the revolution didn't happen that way because we would be left with the same problems that we are addressing today. Mm -hmm. We would not have addressed the pervasiveness of misogynist violence. Uh, it would have been a masculinist revolution had it happened. Uh, yeah. uh, so, and it uh, would have been, it it would would be, been televised. It, would, it, would not, <laughs> it might have been televised. <laughs> 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 But it would not have been a revolution that, that challenged the gender binary, right? Uh, it was too early for that. Uh, and so what I think about now is um, all of the things that we can't imagine at this moment. If then we could not have imagined the extent to which uh, the gender binary has been um, effectively challenged, at least among young people. Um, and, you know, some older people struggle. Uh, what was that you said about pronouns? Uh, but, um, but if you try to think about those things that are not yet imaginable today, but by the time those of you who are students here are uh, Jackie's age or even my age, you will have experienced all kinds of amazing miracles. Uh, and you know, maybe, maybe animals will be differently treated. Uh, maybe there will be this consciousness of, of the extent to which um, the food that we consume is, um, uh, um, creates so much uh, pain and suffering. Uh, I mean, there are all kinds of things that, 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 that are on the agenda of the future. And I think that uh, if our temporalities can expand in such a way that allow us to recognize the not yet imaginable, um, then um, we become more convinced that the work that we are doing at this moment at this moment, we'll make a difference in that future. Mm -hmm. We'll help to shape that future that we cannot yet imagine. Yeah, but I think that's really well said. I mean, it's, I think the, the truth is probably multiple, isn't it? The, the truth is multiple, and the truth is, and the future is multiple. And maybe, maybe um, at, at this moment, we can think about all of the multiple selves that we have been ourselves that we that we recognise that kind of go into. Um, some of what, what made us who we are and what makes us look forward into the future. And I'm sure that lots of people in this room, because of the, 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 the extraordinary um, response, and I'm going to open this out in a minute or two to, to see what questions you have from the audience. And we've got a couple of, of roaming mics, but um, I'm, I'm just going to ask you um, one last question before I do that. I'm just giving the, the microphone people a wee bit notice, you know, so, so they, can, they can get into gear and go, oh, right, it's me. <laughs> it's my turn now, <laughs> like microphone people do. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but just one, I'm just going to ask one last question to Angela and then we're going to, to, to push over. But um, so, what are you going to do when you uh, leave here? What's your next thing that you're going to do, going on to do? Where are you going to go? We're all curious because we'll miss her. And we're all curious. I'm going home. <laughs> you're going home and you're just going to hang out. <laughs> no, I'm embarrassed to say this, uh, but... Um, I have to have, um, what is it called? Periodontal surgery. Oh, right. Just on one tooth. And then I have to have um, foot surgery. Gail, you remember when my foot was hurting? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, so and, and I had to um, schedule these surgeries at a time when I would be at home for 
uh, at least two weeks. And I did that back in January when I couldn't figure out. Uh, so I'm going to be at I'm home for you. two weeks, and I'm oh, looking wow. forward to it, That's even though to I do have to. <laughs> That's going to be well. Can I can I thank you because this has just been an amazing <laughs> conversation, hasn't it? It's just been so, such a wonderful conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to have a time for some questions now. Um, so if we can start from this side, yeah, okay. Hello. Oh, oh can I just say, uh, we're going to have really short, precise questions. <laughs> and I'm going to be brutal. I will stop you <laughs> if you go. Okay. Okay, so think about it, right. and everyone else, thank All you. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much for that conversation, it was beautiful. Um, so I have a question about activism and the academy. As someone who's existed um, on both sides of that, and arguably still does, what do you think the relationship between the two should be? Thank you. Great. Um, do you want to answer that question, Jackie? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm going to let you answer that well, question. I, well, thank you for, for raising it. Uh, and, um, you know, it's not uh, accidental that students have been the forefront of revolutionary change um, all over the world. And um, But it's not as if the institutions that constitute the academy are saying, um, calling upon you and telling you that we will prepare you to be revolutionaries. <laughs> um, it's always a struggle. Um, and I, I think that it's, it's absolutely essential to take that struggle into these institutions. Uh, um, because we need knowledge. Uh, but we also need to recognize that, um, that universities aren't the only uh, venues for the production of knowledge, that knowledge gets produced in other sites as well. And, and therefore, the, the struggle for interdisciplinary um, uh, approaches to learning is so important. Uh, and the conception of interdisciplinarity in a, a broader sense, uh, not simply the disciplines, the existing disciplines or existing fields, uh, but recognizing the production of knowledge in other places. Um, you know, for example, in the US, we have this uh, uh, emergent field, uh, which is, um, which we refer to as critical prison studies, uh, right? It's not criminology, it's not prison history, it's, it involves uh, feminist studies, it involves uh, you know, black and um, Latino studies, it involves, uh, um, of course, literature, and so forth and so on. Uh, uh, but it's important to acknowledge that, the, um, that in many ways the, 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 the foundational knowledge uh, for that field comes from prisoners themselves. Uh, uh, so, so I think there's so many ways in which we can be um, subversive within these institutions. Uh, at the same time, um, we act almost always as if there is this special um, relationship between activists and uh, the academy. Uh, we don't talk about um, 
the fact that some of the same problems exist in, in other places, in other institutions, uh, in economic institutions. Uh, so I think, I think that, it, that, that, that and, and also we often forget when we're doing organizing work in these academic institutions that there are workers that need to be involved in the first place. Uh, And, 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 and finally, there is oftentimes the argument that this institution does not allow us to do the work that we need to do. We need to be outside. Uh, and, it, and, you know, there's always this discussion about the fact that we can't really do it inside. We need to be outside. Uh, but is there really... And out, is there truly an outside? Do we ever really get outside of the system? We're going to be confronted with many of the same problems wherever uh, we are. And so it seems to me that the point is to create arenas of struggle uh, wherever we are, whatever we are doing. We, ne we don't have to give up. We don't have to capitulate. Uh, and, um, and good luck. <laughs> Thank you. Um, hiya, Jackie and Angela. Um, I organise with a group called Sisters Uncut, and I've kind of... <laughs> oh, no, it's <laughs> um, I've got a kind of geeky organising question as well, I think. Um, we don't do a lot of uh, funding of our activism here in, in the UK, but I've noticed that in the States, um, there is a lot more money going around for activism and when we compare our organizing and the groups that we organize with here, there seems to be a lot more money and a lot more paid activists um, in the States. And um, they seem to achieve a lot more and have a lot more spread, but I also have a lot of reservations about that and I kind of wonder where you situate your politics within that, those two different models. Should we be organizing without money or will the revolution be funded? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I was thinking about this term that circulates now that's called the nonprofit industrial complex. Uh, and the fact that many of the foundations that fund um, organizations uh, make uh, certain kinds of demands. Uh, uh, so there are some activist groups that have decided to try to find alternative uh, modes of funding. Uh, uh, and I, I, you know, I always uh, tell the story of before the, before the foundation community emerged, when we organized in the 1960s and the early 70s, and we raised our own money. And um, I was a member of an organization called uh, SNCC, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee in LA. Um, and Rat Brown, some of you may be, be familiar with him. He was uh, in, in jail. He's actually still in prison now. Um, and we had to raise $100,000 to get him out on bail. And we did that within a relatively short period of time, um, using very primitive technologies. Uh, you know, there was no GoFundMe. Uh, uh, we, we took some tin cans, and I know this sounds like somebody from a prehistoric age telling uh, this uh, story. We took tin cans and, 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 and got uh, white labels and pasted them around the tin cans with uh, the slot in the middle. It said, let rap rap. You know, Rap Brown was known for his oratorical skills. Uh, and and within um, within a few weeks, we had actually raised a hundred thousand dollars, just going door to door, just asking people to donate. And I'm not saying we return to that era, but what I'm saying is that there are alternatives. There are other, you know, ways of of 
of raising money that, uh, that we obviously need if we're going to do uh, the organizing. But, but you should perhaps try to um, uh, follow uh, the conversations of those who are trying to come up with ways of funding radical movements that do not make them beholden to the very corporate structure which they assume they are challenging. Yeah, okay, yeah. thank you. I see, yeah, someone there in the back, is there a question on the back? Yeah, great. I hope I don't faint. Okay. Don't, don't faint. Hello, Professor Davies. <sighs> Oh, I okay, can't, deep I breath. Can't see, I can't see you. Can Where you see are me? you? I'll stand up. Where are you? At the back. Of are, you, the uh, are you? Hi. Oh, you're the all top. the way in. Yeah. Oh, the, I oh, see yeah. you. Hi. No. <laughs> um, I'm a teacher, um, and I'm sitting here with other teachers and students. We are trying to dismantle the British school to prison pipeline over here. And to kind of get English or British people in general to, to understand the word abolition. Uh, and it seems to be a really foreign concept. Do you, since we always follow on the footsteps of America over here, do you have any advice of how we can get through the British establishment, but also British hearts and minds? Thank you. You know, there is a, a, a long history of um, struggle around prison issues uh, here. And I know that tomorrow in the symposium, um, am, I, am I allowed to mention the symposium tomorrow? Of course, of course, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, that there will be a presentation on, on the, the uh, campaign around Holloway Prison, right? Um, so, um, so what I can perhaps say to you is that um, um, developing that kind of consciousness really does require um, a lot of work, a lot of organizing, um, being persistent, uh, and abolition. When, when we first raised the issue of abolition, uh, people thought we were absolutely out of our minds. And now, it's being taken seriously. Um, and I think that uh, the school to prison pipeline is an important uh, target because it indicates the extent to which what happens behind bars, what happens in jails and prisons is, is very much connected to what is happening in um, the uh, society, um, the outside, the inside, outside uh, relationship. And that as a matter of fact, uh, the, the, the real issue with respect to abolishing uh, jails and prisons, uh, and, and we can extend this to uh, the um, police apparatus, is it, the, the real question is not, is not, should not be focused only on those institutions. Uh, because if you simply get rid of prisons, and don't transform society, uh, then you'll end up with another prison-like uh, 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 form of punishment. Uh, so the, the question that is posed by abolition is this. How do we imagine a society that no longer needs to rely on these institutions that uh, uh, so rely on racism and repression and violence. Uh, so what about education and what about healthcare and what about jobs and what about housing? 
it becomes an occasion for us to think about the extent to which the entire society needs to be um, radically overhauled. Uh, and of course, this may not happen tomorrow. And so, so what do we do? We look at schools and we ask ourselves, how, how is it that schools have come to be modeled along the lines of jails? You know, why is it that kids who are in communities, uh, uh, black communities, communities of color, poor communities, go to schools where they're literally being taught uh, the, the discipline that emanates you know, from the juvenile facilities and the prisons. They're, they're going to prep schools for prison. And so, and then of course in the US, uh, I don't know uh, the specific situation here, but, but schools in, in, in poor black working class communities of color have police within the schools. They call them school resource officers. And these are, these are officers, these are police officers whose primary loyalty is to um, the police department and not to the school. And I don't know whether you read about the, 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 the woman, the young girl rather, at a school, and I think it was uh, South Carolina, who was attacked by a school resource officer because she was using her cell phone. And as it turned out, she had had a death in her family. And she was, I mean, it's, it's just, it's just really, uh, don't get me started on this, uh, because I get very, very angry about the extent to which uh, there has al almost been a merging of uh, the uh, educational process and the punishment uh, process. And education uh, then appears to consist primarily of disciplining kids. That's what schools here use solitary confinement a lot. Um, so they'll, you'll, you'll give kids long periods of keeping them completely alone. And in that's a, in a, in in, in a within the, you'll take them out of their classroom situation and put them into another situation. But I was reading in the papers the other day that the instance of using solitary confinement in schools now has reached kind of epic um, proportions, and that children are suffering, young people are suffering real mental health exactly, um, problems exactly. as a result of having to be kept completely on your own, your phone exactly. taken away, nothing, nothing, nothing there at all. And that's you know that's that's a prison technique of solitary confinement. Absolutely, absolutely. And so this means that it's, it's not only teachers who need to be involved in this movement. I think it's great that you said there are teachers sitting up in the balcony. Mm -hmm. Can we see the teachers? And so you need to, to um, appeal to parents and appeal to um, students at this university. Where's your school? East London. Oh, wow. That's a long way away, isn't it? <laughs> but yeah, I, you know, I think that uh, the, from what you say and then uh, from what Jackie says, there's a, the, the, the conditions are really right for the development of the kind of movement that will reveal those connections uh, and will, um, you know, I, I, I'm reluctant to give you advice based on um, our uh, experiences um, uh, because I think that organizing has to reflect uh, the on the ground experiences in a given place. Uh, but we will certainly be available uh, if you have questions and and, and, and would like support and assistance. So, good luck. Thank you. So, Chloe, on that side at the back, is there any question over there? There's one there. Oh, wait, can I just stand here? People have their hand up for a while. Yeah, there's a question there over there. But what is can you stand up, please? There, there up, up, up. Uh, Thank you very much for your talk. It's um, really amazing to hear you speak. I'm from Brazil, and 400 days ago, 400 
eight days ago. They murdered Marielle Franco. And her face, as your face, is in our t-shirts and it empowers us despite she is, she was murdered, brutally murdered. And the conjecture is really bad. As you mentioned, the name we don't say is the president of my country. Mm. Would you have anything to say for us as resistance, as women, and in the memory of Marielle Franco, what should we, uh, a, a message for us to think and to motive us at this moment. Thank you very much. Mariela Presente, thank you so much. I really appreciate the fact that you have evoked um, Mariela Franco in this space uh, um, because she represents precisely uh, the, all of the struggles about which we have been speaking this evening. Uh, um, I, I've had the opportunity to participate uh, in a, a number of events that uh, observe the year, the year, first year uh, anniversary of her assassination. Um, and we also recognize that we have a great deal uh, to learn from the struggles that are unfolding in uh, Brazil. You know, before the election of the person we shall not name um, in Brazil, Brazil, Brazil was really um, the hope for a different future. Uh, you know, before the, before the coup and before the, um, oh, when I think about it, uh, I mean, I, I'm just remembering how excited we were about the developments in Brazil. Uh, and in a sense, it was the same kind of excitement that we had experienced uh, um, with the uh, um, dismantling of apartheid. Uh, because there was a moment when South Africa really represented the possibilities for uh, a non, what they called a non-racist, non-sexist, non-homophobic society. Um, and what was so interesting and what really remains interesting about Brazil is that, that black women really represent the future. And the black women's movement, the black women's movement is the most powerful social movement in Brazil. And Marielle Franco represented that challenge to racism, to uh, police violence, to homophobia. Uh, and this, um, she represented the, the hope of um, black feminism, decolonial black feminism. And, um, now I think about the U.S., for example, and the fact that um, Ilhan Omar, are you familiar with Ilhan Omar? <laughs> and the fact that like Marielle, she's an elected official who's speaking out, who's assuming radical stances, and she has been the target of, of, of multiple death threats. Uh, and you know, we know that uh, the other person we shall not name has consistently uh, tweeted uh, uh, what amount to attacks against her. And, and I'm, I'm glad you, you raised this issue because it allows us to reflect on the work that we need to do to create um, solidarity. And of course, Jackie, you know, you come from a family, a uh, communist family. Uh, uh, I really like your father. <laughs> My dad and says, I was speaking to him on the phone, he's now 94. Mm -hmm. He said to me tonight, just before they came out, give her love to Angela for Christ's sake. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. and, he, and he was just so, um, I mean, for them, they were just so 
excited because they've been part of international struggles mm. against apartheid for peace and and that um, that that continues that inter I mean I think that's w one of the reasons that you're so um, important to, to all of us is that you that you're an internationalist you you make connections between Brazil and between Scotland and between America and between yeah. Palestine and between, you know, it's not all about It's not all about the states, it's not all about the UK, and sometimes... And I think we, we should also talk about the Kurdish women's movement, yeah. Yeah. You know, which is at the forefront of revolutionary struggle. Yeah. Um, um, you know, the reason of, I mentioned the fact that your, um, your, your father was an, is an old communist, I mean old, what, what do I mean he, by old? He'll take that. Okay. <laughs> it's because oftentimes, we forget that the promises of the past should not be discarded. Uh, and with, with all of the problems uh, that uh, uh, revolved around um, you know, communist parties and the, 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 the socialist countries and other places, uh, there was this amazing promise uh, and this sense of connectedness. Uh, and we can't give that up. We have to figure out, you know, how to uh, produce it for our times. I know, because I remember growing up, you know, when the, the Chilean Solidarity Movement, for instance, and it's very big in Glasgow, and lots of Chileans came to, to Glasgow, mm -hmm. and so I learned to sing all of these Chilean um, folk songs, Vence de Amos, and, and then I remember Madame Allende coming to Glasgow, and my mum saying, look at Madame Allende, isn't she in TT? Because <laughs> <laughs> she's quite, quite small and perfectly built, the beautiful hairstyle. And I just remember all of these characters, that you, although yeah. you lived in this specific house in Glasgow, your house was peopled right. by the characters that came through the house, from you know Martin Luther King to Madame Mayendi yeah. to Angela Davis. At your, your house, people came in and out of your house in terms of what you contained in your head and how you connected with people. Um, outside of your own situation and, and around the world. And I think that that, that, that that sense of interconnectedness is very strong, definitely here today. <laughs> and uh, and it's, it's quite, it, it, gives you, it gives you hope because you can, in this political climate, sometimes get to feeling, um, you know, depressed by the state of affairs. Yeah. I, and, and, um, but something like this actually makes you think, no, there, there's, there, there's ways of, of going forward. Yeah. And I, you know, I keep thinking that, um, that, that, that we need, you know, those of us who experience that solidarity of that time need to learn how to talk about uh, uh, the um, emotions that were produced. The fact that, that, that you sent me a kiss, a good night kiss, uh, yeah. you know, means that you felt connected. Uh, and, 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 and I think the kinds of global solidarities that we need today will help to teach us to extricate ourselves from uh, this sense of isolation that we're, you know, we're, uh, we're uh, first and foremost individuals, uh, that, that we're disconnected uh, from our neighbors and certainly we have no idea uh, who lives in other parts of the world. Uh, so how do, you know, how do we learn how to um, offer support to um, Kurdish women uh, who are not only um, at the forefront of um, the, a revolution, a larger social revolution, but who are teaching us that, that women do that work um, because um, it is women who are going to change the world. Um, and, and of course, you know, when I say, when I say women, when I say women, I mean women in the broadest possible terms. And, you know, I mean trans women. I mean, you know, women of color. And I think, and I think that um, men, those whose gender identity, uh, uh, use, um, uses that category, 
should be excited too. <laughs> because, my God, you know, men have had to carry this terrible burden of being, you know, uh, uh, macho and Look at all of the violence in the world that has come from that construction of masculinity. So, 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 what about the men in the audience? Aren't you happy as well that we're leading the way towards something? <laughs> so when we say that, you know, this is the t time of the rise of women. Uh, uh, women never struggle only for themselves. Well, I love having a feminist. It's for everybody. Yeah. I, right. have a, I have a feminist son. Yes, and I, absolutely. And I love, I love having a, a feminist son that, that, um, you know, and watching the, the change that, that's taken place in his absolutely. life and in his ways of embracing being a feminist, you know, um, which is just an extraordinary mm -hmm. thing. And he's made a, a film about a, a strong woman called Little Miss Sumo, about a woman sumo wrestler um, <laughs> recently. But, but it's, really, it's really funny to be a mum of a, a son like that and to watch the different ways that there are of being able to be mm -hmm. a man. I remember when he was 14 and I said to him, Matthew, it's really cool having a lesbian mum. And he said, it's not. <laughs> he, said, he, said, he said, it's not cool at all. He said, it'd be cool to have a lesbian gran. <laughs> <laughs> I told this to my mum and she said, what am I expected to do? That's great. Change my sexuality at the same <laughs> stage of the game. Okay, we have one more question, a couple of us. So, yeah. Would you stand up? Thank you. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Wa alaikum um, salam. <laughs> My name is Amal and I'm with my sister Sarah. We're both from the Goldsmiths Anti-Racist Occupation. I just wanted to say, this is the first black student Muslim BME-led occupation in Goldsmiths history and has been the longest so far. We are on day 43. Everyone, everyone in the occupation loves you and wishes that they could be here, but we were only offered two tickets, which we appreciate. Thank you so much to be here to meet you. So my question is only right, is to be regarding the occupation. My question is, we have various demands and the stuff that we've gone through, white-led occupations in our university never had to go through. Um, two of our demands which I want to talk about today was one regarding Palestinian scholarships. Um, we wanted to reinstate the Palestinian scholarship, but the senior management team who we um, communicate with directly lie to our faces with comfortability. And I, and I feel, yes, it's because we are BME students. They tell us it's illegal to have scholarships for specific persons. And um, we're on day 43, and everyone's getting exhausted, and we really want to keep focus on the demands, and we want it to be successful. So I was wondering if you had any tips, any advice on re, um, regrouping people's focus and keeping it strict to the demands, and how to escalate in a situation where they're waiting for us to exhaust, our scale, exhaust ourselves and go home. Um, so thank you so much for listening. First of all, congratulations, and thank you for the work that you're doing. Um, you know, I don't know whether I have um, advice that will be helpful, but I'm thinking off the top of my head that, uh, that first of all, you should you should de demand the reinstating of the scholarships for uh, Palestinian uh, students. Is this for students from Palestine? Well, have, have you thought about um, an exchange? An exchange? Uh, because there are a number of universities in Palestine. And if you um, instituted an exchange where some goldsmith students would go to Birzet or another university in Palestine, they couldn't claim that you're simply singling out a particular uh, group of people for scholarships. Uh, 
and, um, and they, they have a good um, you know, feminist studies program there. Uh, so have you looked into that at all? Well, that's just, that's just one suggestion that, 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 that I'm making, but, but, but it's really important to be persistent and to be creative uh, mm -hmm. and not to accept uh, the institutional response uh, uh, because there are always ways in which uh, uh, those um, positions can be changed. Uh, uh, so what are the other demands? Okay, so we have a list on our Twitter and Facebook page, there's 12. So another one is, we want to look into the attainment gap between white students and their black counterparts. Um, thank you. We also want to bring security in-house, majority are black security guards and Latino. Also, what we wanted was, am I forgetting? What do you want to do with yes. security? We wanted to bring security in-house because they don't give them sick leave, they don't give them living, living wage, um, London living wage, and also they're not allowed to eat in the canteen with students. Um, we also wanted to have black counsellors in the mental wellbeing team because the services they have only support white people. Where are the black counsellors? And also many students have complained, many international students have committed suicide and many have complained that whenever they try to talk about black issues or, you know, um, seminar leaders being disrespectful and, you know, using the N-word in lectures and they tell their seminars, do not use the N-word, we don't feel comfortable. Nothing, nothing is done about it. And imagine students, you know, they feel like they're stressed. And imagine if you're in a situation where it's fight or flight, but you can't fight it because they're like, don't answer me back. And you can't leave because you need your degree. You're consistently stressed and there's nothing there. No counselors understand that. Um, other demands, so many. <laughs> okay, well, Maybe thank you. You know, that's, I, that, that gives me a sense of, of the work that you're doing. And I, I, I think um, that, that, it is so important in all of these struggles to call for structural change. Uh, uh, too frequently, demands have focused on issues that can be um, construed as assimilation. Uh, uh, that, um, that institutions are simply asked to bring in those who were previously marginalized. Uh, and the problem, I mean, that's the diversity approach. I don't know whether you all use the term diversity here. Diversity? <laughs> inclusion? <laughs> yeah, you know, diversity and inclusion are the, are the, are the watchwords of, of educational systems in the corporate world everywhere. Because, because it's really easy for them to diversify and include as long as the apparatus keeps functioning in exactly the same way it functioned when people were marginalized. So it's so important to include demands that call for transformation, that call for structural change, that call for justice. Uh, if you're gonna call for diversity, say diversity and justice, inclusion and transformation. Good luck with your struggle. So we're gonna have one final question. Yes. Hello, hello uh, Jackie and Angela. Uh, mine's a really quite straightforward one. Uh, it's an invitation to actually everybody who's here and to you yourself, Angela, particularly if you happen to be back in the UK. On the 14th of any month, there's a, there's a current struggle going on in the name of uh, the 72 people who lost their lives at Grenfell Tower. Every single part of British society failed the people who lived in that tower. And it's very difficult, we're coming up to the second year anniversary, it's very difficult to keep going. 
it's very difficult to keep the energy going within the group. Uh, but if you were in the UK, 14th of any month, we know it's going to be an extremely long, hard struggle where we see the establishment waiting for us to be forgotten. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, but we want the energy to be kept going. So anybody, your struggle is our struggle. If you have children, they certainly go to schools where that cladding is on those buildings. If you go to hospitals, it's on those hospitals. Anywhere you go, that cladding that burned to death or contributed to the death of 72 people, this is your struggle. That, I believe that's the interconnectedness that we've been hearing about today. So it's an invitation to you, Angela, and you, Jackie, if you happen to be around. Um, please come and join us. Thank you. 14th of any month. Thank you. Anybody, anybody. In fact, the, the survivors recognise that not everybody can make it to London at 7 p.m. on the 14th of every month. They encourage people to have your own silent vigils in your own towns, in your own spaces. Uh, they recognise and welcome and support. Um, thank you. And thank you. Okay, so we had one question over here, and um, one more. Um, hello, and thank you, Sisters Uncut Racial Justice Network. Um, I'm a trustee of a charity based in Leeds, and we are the Racial Justice Network, and so... Um, so my question actually was, you only have to go on uh, Twitter to know that patriarchy is having a bit of a difficult time. Um, so I am wondering, are we reaching capitalism's end game? <laughs> I wish. I really wish. I really wish. Uh, but I do think that um, we are witnessing um, the, 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 the contradictions uh, that might help us to speed up the process. Uh, um, but, you know, I, I think I'll, I'll use your question as an opportunity to um, speak about the way in which the um, global campaign against misogynist violence um, um, is not, doesn't always fun focus sufficiently on structural issues. There still somehow is the assumption that these men do what they do uh, because they're defective. And that um, the punishment has to consist in focusing only or primarily on, on the individual. They lose their jobs, they go to jail, whatever. And it seems to me that the fact that in the struggle against racism, we've reached the point where there's a popular understanding of the institutional character of racism, of the structural uh, uh, dimension of racism. And we can't simply um, um, assume that, that um, racism is the, the product of an individual attitudes. Okay, so you know, you're a racist, uh, yeah, go to an unlearning, raci ra uh, unlearning racism workshop and then come back. And, uh, so we're learning now that it's about a lot more than that. And why can't we uh, use that insight to understand that the misogynist violence, which is the most pandemic form of violence in the world, is, is embedded in the very structures of a capitalist, heteropatriarchal society. And how do we begin? 
And how do we begin to translate that into our practice, uh, into our activism? Uh, uh, so I think that's really the question. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, capitalism is in bad shape. I mean, capitalism is in really good shape. <laughs> and, 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 and people are in bad shape. Uh, when, when, we consist, when we consider that the concentration of wealth is unlike anything that anyone could have ever imagined. You know, the fact that a few billionaires uh, um, have control over more wealth than half of the planet's population. It's ridiculous. Um, so I think that in the process of doing this work against racism, against misogyny, against uh, homophobia, uh, for the environment, uh, we haven't really been able to speak about the centrality of environmental work. It's kind of like ground zero of social justice work. Uh, uh, yeah. Because if the environment is destroyed, it will make no s If the environment is destroyed, it will make no sense that we will have finally uh, purged the world of racism or misogyny. <laughs> Why, we'll have no place. <laughs> so yeah, that makes sense. Uh, so um, I think that, um, that what we need to do is do the work that we can do right now. And it can happen in so many ways. It's not just uh, the traditional, you know, activists. Uh, we, we assume activists are the one who's the ones who spend 24 hours doing activist work, right? Uh, and yeah, um, that happens. But you can do it in, in you could do it within any context. Uh, uh, you can share ideas. A part of this struggle, an essential element of this struggle, is ideological and changing people's minds or, or, or helping people to recognize the degree to which thoughts, which they, are, they assume are their own thoughts, are actually, are actually the ideas that have been inculcated, uh, that emanate from the state that we're really doing the state's work. Um, but, and, and I, I know this is the last question, and, and I'm, I'm sitting here thinking that this has been such a wonderful conversation, and I really, I, I, I'm, I'm so happy that I had the opportunity to share this stage with Jackie Kay. She's, an, she's so amazing. <laughs> And I looked at her, you know, I looked at her as a writer and her, 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 her beautiful poetry and her, you know, amazing um, novels and memoirs and, and, and I know that you're happy doing the work that you do. I can see uh, by the way you smile that you, you know, you love, even though it might be hard, you love the work that you're doing. And at the same time, you're, you're using that work to help advance the struggle for global justice. And I think that is what we all have to do. We have to ask ourselves how we can contribute doing the work that um, most fulfills us. Uh, uh, because if you don't, then you know, you'll do it for a couple of years and you'll get tired. And you'll leave it behind. So figure out a way in which you can do the work that most fulfills us, and look after ourselves while we while and we look, do after it. look after ourselves exactly while, while, while we do it, and try to look after ourselves. But it's been an absolute. I think you'll all agree. It's been an absolute pleasure, a blast, a complete <laughs> dream, a complete dream come true. I've had to pinch myself several times sat here on this uh, on this chair, on this wicker chair, talking to the really wonderful, dynamic, mesmerizing. Courageous, true, and lovely, Angela Davis.
Thank you very, very much. Thank you to Jackie, thank you to Angela, thank you all of you for your dynamism and your energy. So we say see you soon. We don't say goodbye. Okay, thank you everyone.